Hey, I'm Darren. I'm one of the pastors here at Focus 314. And that was a pretty intense little video, wasn't it? <laughs> and just to let you know right now that we are in week two of a series called I Declare War. And to let you know just right off the, the bat, this is not going to just be an easy, fun, uh, really passive series. This is a, a pretty aggressive, pretty in-your-face, challenging series. I declare war is not something that you can do on a passive level. It is pretty aggressive in nature. And that leads us to the thing that we're talking about. Like we, We're going to declare war because here's what I want you to know. That a lot of times in the summer, anybody like just want to take it easy in the summer, right? Like it's finally hot in Arizona. Anybody realize that? Yeah. If you didn't, then you're going to this week, right? And you're just like, you're like, I just want to take it easy. I want to, it's vacation time, right? Let me help you with something. You cannot take a vacation from your issues. But I believe that we can find victory from our issues this summer which is why we're going to declare war. And when we make the statement that we will declare war, there is something that rises up inside of our spirit. The wolf rises in our spirit. Theodore Roosevelt said this. He said, all men who feel any power of joy of battle know what it's like when the wolf rises in the heart. That there's something inside of your spirit that wells up inside of you and you are ready to go forward in the war that is in front of you. Why do you need to declare war? Because you are already in one. You are already in a war. You have issues. Anybody in here not have issues? Right? Like everybody's like, well, I don't feel like I did, but nobody else is raising their hand. We all have issues, right? And we need to be able to declare war on them because they've already declared war on us. So we're going to face these issues that we have, and instead of just taking a vacation this summer, what well, my prayer, my hope is, is that there are some of you in here today that are going to have a victorious moment. Amen. Come on, anybody want to have a victorious yeah. moment? Yeah. That's what I'm praying for, and that's what we're hoping is going to happen during this series. So here's what I want to let you know is that last week, we declared war. This week, we're making a declaration of war. And in fact, many of you, as you were walking in, you received talk notes. And on the back of those talk notes, if you flip that over, there is a declaration of war. I declare war on, and there's a blank. And you need to fill in that blank. What is it that you need to declare war on? I, I don't know what your issue is that you're dealing with, but I know that every single one of us has something. And so I would ask you to do this. Right now even, begin to pray about what it is that you need to fill in in that blank. Some of you know exactly what it is because you've been battling it for a long time. And fill that in. Put that, don't, don't just sugarcoat it, right? Don't just say, uh, I just have a problem with TV one minute a day. <laughs> that doesn't do any good, right? Like it, you're not doing any good if you just sugarcoat it. I want to ask you to pray about it and be as brutally honest as possible. It's a declaration of war. And then what I want to ask you to do is that every single declaration needs a signature on it. So I want you to write it down, whatever it issue it is, and then I want you to sign it and date it. Because my prayer and my hope is, is that for many of you in here today, today is your Independence Day. Amen. Today, June 8th, is your July 4th. And that you are going to be able to find victory and independence from this. That you have a declaration of war in front of you. And then the most important thing that I would ask you for, for you to do with that declaration is that I want you to be able to think about somebody that you know that truly loves Jesus and loves you. And then you share with them what you just declared war on. Like I said, they, they need to love Jesus because you might love them, but, but they might use it against you, right? And I don't want to see that for any of you. I don't want to see it come back and bite you. But you absolutely 100% need somebody in your foxhole with you. Right. When you make a declaration of war that there's going to be somebody who needs to have your back because you're going to get attacked from the back end as well. And so my hope for you is that you're going to have victory. To make this declaration of war, I want you to be able to write it down. I want you to be able to sign it, date it, and then you need to be able to tell somebody about it. We're declaring war over the issues that we are facing. This is not an easy series. This is a challenging series. And my prayer and my hope is that you are not going to be able to just 
Just brush it underneath the rug anymore, but there is going to be victory for each and every single one of you. How many of you are ready for some victory in your life today? Come on, somebody. I just love it so much. Maybe some of you are still in that, maybe you're still in that place of like, I'm not sure what to put down. I'm not sure what I should declare war on. Well, how about you ask this question? What is defiling you? What is, it, what is it that's causing you to fall into yeah, yuck, Muh. What is it that makes you feel? What is it that you know you shouldn't be? What's defiling you? Back when I was a, I was a junior in college, uh, my parents came for a visit, which when you're a junior in college, every once in a while, not every single day, but every once in a while, you appreciate when your parents come and visit you. Because, because many of you know that when you're a college student, you are a starving college student, right? And having your parents come and visit you means they're like, man, I'm going to be able to eat some real food, not the cafeteria food. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? Like, so my parents were coming to visit me, and, and I was thinking to myself, oh, yeah, come on. Now I'm going to actually be able to eat this weekend. I love it. And, and they wanted to go. So I was going to school in, in southern Missouri, and they came and picked me up, and they wanted to go visit this small town in northern Arkansas. Not my first choice, but I love my parents and I want to honor them. So absolutely, mom and dad, we'll go to northern Arkansas, right? Like some of you have been to northern Arkansas and you're like, I don't know what you're doing. So we go to northern Arkansas. We visit this little small town and, and they picked me up on, on Friday, drove uh, there. And by the time we got there, it was pretty late at night. I'm starving. Remember, because I'm a starving college student, like I was always starving, right? And, and so I'm like, I'm so hungry. And I'm like, I'm like, hey, dad, you know, can, can we go get something to eat? And the only place that was open in this little small town by the time we got there was McDonald's. I didn't care, right? Like I did not care at that time because like, I, I'm a starving college student. I'm going to eat whatever. So we go to McDonald's and, and I order a, a quarter pounder with cheese because I'm a college student and, and I don't care, right? Like it's not my first choice, but I'm going to eat. So, so we get uh, back to the place, or to the hotel that we were at, and I, and I scarf down uh, this, this quarter pounder with cheese, drink the soda, we go to bed, and, and everything feels right with the world. Until about, until about 2 o'clock in the morning. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up, something's wrong. <laughs> Something is, something's not right. I don't know what it is, but something is not right. Right, because it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm a little like disheveled. I, I, you know, you're trying to figure out. I just know the only thing that I knew is I needed to run to the bathroom. That's what I needed to do. I needed to get to the bathroom. But then when I even got to the bathroom, I wasn't sure. Like, should I go in this way? Y'all know what I'm talking about. This is a bad moment. And I am so thankful that in the place that we were at, that where the toilet was situated was very close to the bathtub. And so I just had to situate myself. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? That quarter pounder with cheese was defiling me in that moment. And it was not a good thing. Until about noon of the next day, I felt like I was going to die. I, I was hoping that I was going to die because I couldn't live with that. And then about noon of the next day, all of a sudden, this, this thing of like a lot of quarter pounder with cheese decided it was time to get out of my system. And it all came up. And I felt, oh man, I felt so much better. I did not want to go back to McDonald's, but what is defiling you? There's a powerful statement that Jesus says in Matthew 15. He said, then Jesus called to the crowd to come in here, and he said, listen, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. See, many times what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about the words that we say. And many times, many times what we think about ourselves is so attached to the words, to words. 
And many times we think to ourselves, you know what, I, I, I don't feel, I feel like I'm less than, I feel like I'm this because of something that was said to me in my past. Because somebody said this to me, and and so it makes me feel insecure, it makes me feel this way, and and many times we want to just be able to point the finger at somebody else and say, it was your words that defiled me, but yet Jesus is saying, it's not not what you're getting on the external, you are defiled by the words that are coming out of your mouth. Here's the reality that many of us need to understand today, that you are in a war, and most of the time you are your own worst enemy. In the words that you say, the careless words that slip out all the time. And so what we're doing during this series as we are declaring war is that we are talking about specific attributes that a wolf has is, as the wolf rises inside of our heart, that we want to be able to conquer these things, that there needs to be a victorious moment. And so we're looking at different attributes of the wolf to be able to see how we can overcome these issues that we are facing. And so today, what we are going to do is we're going to learn to speak like a wolf. We're going to learn to speak like a wolf. Some of you are like, I, man, I, I read Little Red Riding Hood. Like, that's not, I'm not supposed to be a wolf. It's a big bad wolf, right? Like, let me tell you something. Is that God created all things. He created all creatures. And there are attributes inside of each and every single one of them that we desperately need to be able to overcome the issues that we face. And so just like the enemy to demonize an animal that we desperately need to look at the attributes that they have. And so we're not going to try to, we're not going to be able to go along with some fairy tales. We're going to go ahead and say, okay, what does the wolf have that I need to be able to have? And that's why we're going to learn to speak like a wolf. Now, the way the wolves speak, man, it's it's amazing. It's powerful. Like, I've been doing a lot of study on wolves, and wolves communicate. They communicate through scent. You know, like their noses are so much more sensitive than we have. They have different scents that they have, and so they can communicate through scent. They They communicate through body language, like just even the way that they'll touch each other with their tail and the way that they're positioned of their tail, like like they communicate that way. Wolves, like we're still doing study and uh, and it's amazing to be able to see uh, how we're still learning all of the different facial expressions that wolves make to communicate with facial expressions, which is true of us as well, isn't it? It's so true of us as well. Like uh, sociologists will even say that about 55% 55% of communication happens through facial expressions. And then we wonder why we get into miscommunication when we're just sending text messages and DMs, right? Anybody been there before? You're in a fight through a text message. Well, I didn't even mean what you said, right? Which is why you're, man, you get a text message from me, most of the time it's just gonna be a little fist bump. That's a... I'm a little emoji fist bump. If you need to be able to talk about something, you need to call me because you're going to be able to hear the tone of my voice and, you're going to, and I'm going to hear the tone of your voice. I'm not trying to have an email battle with anybody. It's not happening. Like, I'm just not going to do it, okay? I would suggest the same for you. Just do emojis. Fist bump, fire. That's all I got, man. That's, I'm telling you, and those of you that get text messages from me, you know it. Fist bump, fire, fist bump. All's good, Right? That's what, because I'm not trying to do that because facial expressions are so much a part of what we do. It's the same with wolves. Vocally, wolves express themselves. Four different ways that that wolves express themselves vocally. They'll bark at each other. Like, hey, what's up? Right? Hey, what's up, man? Where they're barking at each other. They'll growl at each other. Hey, what's up? You know, like, back off. This is my meat right here. You know, like, they growl at each other. They'll whimper at each other. Hey, what's up? (laughs) I got a little bad fight right there. I'm sorry, man. Like, they whimper at each other. And then the last one that they do is they, they howl, don't they? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about with a wolf howl. Wolf howls are so, I just think they're cool, right? Like, anybody who's even ever seen a wolf howling at a moon t-shirt knows how cool it is, right? I almost bought one this week, babe, but I said, no, we're not doing that. We've got vacation coming up. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But, dude, it's cool, isn't it? Right? Like, and something amazing happens when wolves are even howling at each other. They do this thing called uh, dissonance. Dissonance, disson- what dissonance means is that they're like, they're pitchy on purpose, okay? So like it, 
They're not trying to harmonize with each other. They're trying to sound different from the other person. Like during worship, some of you were sitting next to somebody who has a little bit of dissonance, right? And you're like, come on, man, like we're going to get on board with this, right? But they do it on purpose. It's not on accident like what I do. They do it on purpose. And, and they believe, they're still doing studies, but part of the reason why they believe that they do that is because then you don't know how many you don't know how many wolves are actually howling. Like they could, there could be five, there could be 50. You don't know. You just know there's a bunch of wolves howling and it sounds like it's coming from over there, so I'm going over here, right? So they do that. It's amazing why wolves' howls are powerful too. The wolves' howls can travel up to 10 miles away. 10 miles, that's powerful, isn't it? Like most of us in here, we don't, have, we don't have a voice that is that powerful, that can travel that far. My voice was doing pretty good. I was coming down from this cold, and my voice was doing pretty good until we had worship. And come on, y'all, I can't hold anything back. I don't know. I, I'm going to let it all out. Now my voice is trash, and it's going to be trash for the next three days because I love worshiping Jesus too much. But nobody heard me 10 miles away. Some of you in the back row were like, I still heard you. Come on, Pastor, you know, like. But we don't think of our words and our voice being that powerful, yet we can still now communicate across the world in a second, can't we? Yeah. Your words are powerful. Just this, just this week, I was communicating to one of our missionaries in Cyprus. I'm telling you, your words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Man, the tongue can bring death or life. Your words can be either life-giving or life-taking. Your words are powerful. And those who love to talk will reap the consequences. I love the word consequences. Because consequences, you can have, you can have good consequences, right? Like I bought, I bought flowers for my wife. Now I have some good consequences from that, Right? <laughs> Or you can have negative consequences. I said some really harsh things to my wife, and now I'm dealing with the consequences of that. <laughs> consequences can be either rewarding or they can be full of punishment, can't they? Depending on how you speak. You can either choose to be life-giving or you can choose to be life-taking. We need to learn that our words are extremely powerful. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Another version says that whatever your heart is full of, that's what's going to come out. Y'all are full of something. You want to know what you're full of? Listen to the words that you're saying. And that's going to be the fruit of what you're full of. Is it going to be life-giving or is it life-taking? You're full of something. Out of the abundance of the heart, what you fill yourself with is important because that's what's going to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. The evil person out of the evil, tre evil treasure brings forth evil. Continue on. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word. Every careless word that we speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Anybody feel encouraged right now? Like, man, that's, that is, why? Because we say careless things, don't we? Yeah. All of us, we fall into places where we are careless with the words that we say. You are going to absolutely 100% give account for the words that you say. How many of you would like to be able to do that today? <laughs> Think about this. Think about the conversations that you have had this past week. All the words that you have said, all of the careless things, all of the good things, all of the bad things. How about we go ahead and give account for them today? What if we were to pull one of you out from here and put all of your words up on the screen? How would you feel in that moment? 
Would you be like, no, nah, no, I'm going to a different church. I'm not, I'm not going back in that church. I cannot show my face back in that church. I'm not doing it. I got to find new friends. I can't have any of these friends. Any. Because, we would, because we say careless words. You're going to give account for them. Which is why my hope is that you're going to learn to speak like a wolf, understand that your words have power, and instead of saying careless words, you're going to say careful words. Careful words that we're speaking over each other. You're going to give account for it. So why not right now make the choice to say, if I'm going to give account for it someday, then I need to be accountable for it today. We need to learn to speak like a wolf. Here, I want to give you the big takeaway, sermon in a sentence right away, to be able to begin to have you just let this flow over you. That if you have made the choice to say yes to Jesus, and if Jesus is the Lord of your heart, then he needs to be the Lord of your lips as well. Come on now. If he is the Lord of your heart, he needs to be the Lord of your lips. And instead of saying careless words, that you are saying careful words, and what is coming out of your mouth is what you are filling yourself with, and that is the word of God. Come on now. Encouraging anybody today? Like I said, this is not a passive series that we are going through, that we are going forth, because here's what I hope to be able to see is that each and every single one of you are going to choose to be life-giving. That we will make the choice to be life-giving to the people around us, that we will choose our words very carefully, and that we are going to be life-giving. And so today what I want to give you is three major areas where you are going to choose to be life-giving. Three areas where you say, I need to be life-giving in this situation. Number one, I need to choose to be life-giving to other people. That the words that I say, that I choose to be life-giving to other people around me. That the people that I associate with, that I will be intentional about the words that I say to them. Yeah. Ephesians 4.29. It said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. Somebody say building up. Building up. I hope that you are going to be building up instead of tearing down. That you make the choice to be life-giving and not life-taking, that you will build others up instead of tearing them down. That you will say whatever it is that is helpful to building others up according to their needs. That's powerful right there. Because many times we want to build somebody up according to, well, that's what I see in you. You need to go ahead and do this. No, according to their needs. Build somebody up according to their needs that they may it may benefit those who listen. You have to make the choice to be life-giving. You need to make the choice to be a benefit to other people. You need to make the choice to build up instead of tear down. The choice is yours. What are you going to choose today? I'm going to choose to be life-giving, and so I'm going to declare war on the careless words that I have said. Let me tell you what, you know, here's the, here's the reality. Is you cannot be accidentally life-giving. You can't do it. You can't be accidentally life-giving. Man, you look, you look so good today. Oops, that just slipped out. Right? Ooh, I wish I wouldn't have said that one. Babe, you are such an amazing mother to our boys. Oops, sorry about that one. I didn't mean for that to come out. It just came out. You cannot say to your dad, Dad, you are such an amazing dad. Thank you for raising me in the ways of the Lord. Oops, I'm sorry about that. You can't accidentally be life-giving. You have to make the choice. You have to be intentional about the words that you are saying to the people around you. Don't be careless. Be careful. Think before you speak. Speak like a wolf. Why? Because your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. And they can be either life-giving to others or they can be life-taking to others. Make the choice to be life-giving. It's so much better. It's so much better. I I'll tell you what. I, I, grew up, I grew up in the Midwest and I grew up in sports, and then I spent time in the military in the Marine Corps. 
And let me tell you that in all of those areas that were raising me up during informative times, none of the Midwest sports, Marine Corps, none of them were about building other people up. Right? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, we're friends, and so I'm going to make fun of you until you cry. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Right? Like, well, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Can't you take a joke? That's not a joke. That's not a joke. Here's a joke. You know, uh, French fries were not first fried in France. They were fried in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> I took a second on some of y'all. You were like, what? Oh, that was horrible. <laughs> That is horrible. I'm going to say it later, but that still was horrible. Yeah, right? That's a joke. Making fun of somebody is not a joke. That's not a powerful thing to be able to build a relationship. You know what's powerful? Building somebody up. You know what's powerful? Letting them know that God created them for something special. That's what's powerful. Why don't you go ahead and be life-giving instead of life-taking? It's not funny. Well, it's all fun with us. Yeah, until it's not, right? Because you had a bad day and somebody said something that you normally know is a joke and it cut you to the core. And you've been on the other side of it where you said those things and you wish that you didn't. It's not funny. Choose to be life-giving, that we will be people that will build each other up instead of tearing each other down. Colossians 4, 6, I love this verse too. Let your conversation be always full of grace. Somebody say grace today. Grace. Seasoned with salt. Man, that's so good. Let your conversation always be full of grace. When you're having a conversation with somebody, here's the best way to be able to think the best of that person. Well, you know what? They don't deserve for me to be life-giving. That's what grace is. Getting what you don't deserve. So they might absolutely always be cutting you down. But your conversation needs to always be full of grace. Yeah. Don't say to yourself, well, you know what? I got to stand up for myself and I need to make sure they know that I'm right. <laughs> really? I don't think that God has ever called us to be right. He's called us to be able to love. Has it ever benefited you to prove that you were right? Now, all of a sudden, it's like, hey, this is not okay. Because yeah. now you're talking to me. It doesn't benefit us. When has it ever been a benefit for us to be able to prove that we're right? Which is exactly what salt does, isn't it? Why do our conversations need to be seasoned with salt? What does salt do? It makes everything better, <laughs> doesn't it? Like, man, I got some potato salad here. This is not, this is a potato salad that was bought at Walmart. That's exactly what that is. I invited you over to my barbecue and you stopped at Walmart. You couldn't even go to Fry's to get the potato salad. You went to Walmart to get the potato salad. And so what do I need? Babe, give me some salt. This needs some salt. I got to make this. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Salt makes things better. Some of you even put salt on, anybody put salt on watermelon? So, yeah, exactly. Why? Why do you do that? Because you're weirdo. No, you're not, because it makes it better, doesn't it? Salt makes things better. You need to have a conversation. When you are going into a conversation, do you think to yourself, are you careful enough to be able to say, am I making this relationship better? It should always be full of grace and always be full of seasoned salt. Be careful of the words that you say, right? Now, here's the thing that I love. I love about the fact that it says, it says salt here. Because sometimes salt, sometimes salt can be a little bit of a like, ah, I don't, that was, maybe I don't want that salt there. Like that, like you like salt on your watermelon, me, not so much. It has a little bit of a bitterness to it, doesn't it? Right? There's a little bit of that saltiness in salt, right? Like, it doesn't say to make sure that you just have sugar and all the sweet, nice things that go along with that. 
So when you're having conversations with somebody and they say with one of your friends and they're like, hey, look, I'm thinking about going down this road and I'm thinking about making uh, these choices and, and this is what I think, then don't, you don't just say, oh, that sounds amazing and wonderful and I'm just here to be able to support you in all of the horrible decisions that you're making right now. That's not what it says. Season with salt means that you are wanting to be able to make it better, full of grace. And so if you see a friend of yours that is going down a path that you're like, that's, that's not a good path. I know it's not a good path because I've been on that path myself before. And you do not want to go down that path because there's bad stuff down there. And I'm trying to make you better. I want to make our relationship better. And so I'm going to be able to speak full of grace. Hey, look, don't do it. I'm not just speaking all sweet and nice things. I'm trying to help somebody be better. Full of grace. Full of grace. So you don't go into that situation and, and be like, you see your, your buddy and be like, man, you're a jerk. Why have you been talking to your family the way you talk to your family? I can't even believe that your wife is still with you, right? There's no grace in that, is there? <laughs> well, I told them. Season with salt. <laughs> No, grace says, hey what's, hey, what's going on? Because it seems to me like, and there's been a lot of anger inside of you recently. Why, why, why would you say there's anger inside of me? Well, I mean, that response. But also, I noticed how you were talking to your kids, and you don't usually talk to your kids that way. And man, I'm, I'm worried about you. What's going on? Full of grace, seasoned with salt that we want to choose to be life-giving to other people. Okay. Life-giving to other people. Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on. Ah, oh, I love that so much. Let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some have to do it. No, no, we're going to encourage one another. We're here to be able to spur one another on. We're here to be able to encourage one another. Sociologists, or not sociologists, but, but uh, uh, biologists who have been studying wolves, that they, they notice something about one of the things that, that the howl does. That, that there are some times that, that the pack is getting ready to go on a hunt. And that they will, they get kind of, they get each other riled up, right? Like you got to work yourself up to be able to go kill a, a, a big, huge buffalo or something like that. Like, it's big. Like, they had a chance. Wolves can die from going on the hunt. And so what they'll do before they're going on the hunt is that they'll begin to rile each other up. And so one wolf, one wolf will begin to howl, right? Like, he'll just start howling out. Some of you are just waiting for me to howl, aren't you? Like, I could just, maybe that's just me. I'm waiting for myself to howl. <laughs> but one of them will just howl. And then, and then the other ones will, will be like, you feeling that, right? And some of them will be like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, we're going to get ready. I'm hungry, too. Let's go. Let's go do this. And then you always got one or two of them that are still in the pack, you know, in larger packs. They're like, no, 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 no. I'm not feeling it right now. Like, I am still just wanting to rest here in the den. It's nice and comfortable. And so what they'll do is they'll still, more of them will howl. And then pretty soon, the one that's just sitting there, he's like looking around like all these people are howling. And like, I'm getting excited about all of this howling. And they are spurring one another on. They are encouraging each other to be able to do what? Go face the battle that is in front of them. Which is why we want to be able to be in a place like this where we are shouting out our hallelujah, where we're singing a little bit louder because there's some of you that walked into a room like this and you weren't feeling it. You weren't feeling like this should be a summer that you're going to declare war. You just want to be able to come in and take a vacation and to be able to fall into a place where you're even worse off than you were before. And you needed to walk into a place like this where you heard some people shouting it out, where you heard some howling going on, where it rises the wolf up inside of your spirit, where you're spurring each other on. You need to choose in these moments to come in here and to shout it out. Maybe not for yourself, but for the person next to you who's going through a bad situation situation because they need to be spurred on and so what i want to encourage you to do make the choice howl it out and let everybody know man i'm going on this thing i'm going to war with you 
I got a war in front of me, but I'm going to war with you as well. And you are spurring each other on, encouraging each other. And it makes a choice. It absolutely takes a choice for you to do that. You don't just wake up on Sunday morning and be like, well, all right, yeah. You got to work. You work yourself up, don't you? Well, I'm telling you what, like in my house, man, Sunday morning, church, church starts at about 530 in my house. I'm not even playing around. Hey, Siri, why don't you go ahead and play that Focus 314 playlist? Come on now. And then we start hearing worship ringing out through the entire house. It starts just building us up inside of our spirit. Same thing needs to be done for you, that you choose to be life-giving. Hey, hey, I know you're going through a tough time right now. I know you're going through a difficult situation, but do you remember the last time that you were in a situation like this? And do you remember how God came through for you in that moment? Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Well, guess what? He's going to do it again. And you're speaking life into them over and over again because all of us, all of us get into those places where we need somebody to howl next to us. You can be that person if you choose to be life-giving. You got to choose to be life-giving. The second place, the second area that you need to be able to choose today to be life-giving, that you can choose to be life-giving to your future. The words that you say can be life-giving to your future. Not yet, guys. He's looking at me like, no, not yet. There's three of them, three areas, not two areas. We're just having fun. <laughs> Brianna's like, I told you so. It doesn't do right to be right. You gotta love him, Brianna, that's what you do right. <laughs> Full of grace, Brianna. <laughs> we have fun at our church, I'm just letting you know, right? Okay, that's what it is. But you can speak life into your future. Check this out in Mark 11. It says this. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. And truly I tell you, if anyone says to the mountain, if anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart but believes what they will say, it will happen. It will be done. But you have to speak it out. I'm going to tell you, I believe with everything inside of me, everything inside of me, that the way you speak at and the way you speak about the mountains that you are facing today absolutely plays into the effect of how you're going to face them. Wow. And it will play into the impossible being done into those mountainous situations that you are facing. If you just speak to the mountain, it's going to move. Now, let's, let me let, let you know right here. What that, what that doesn't mean is that if you believe in your heart enough that, that your Toyota Corolla is horrible and that you deserve a Ferrari and that absolutely God is going to be able to change your Corolla into a Ferrari, that it's going to happen. It's not play like that. Jesus is not your genie. Right. And you are not Aladdin, Okay. <laughs> That's not how it works. But if you have faith inside of your heart that you are going to be able to overcome, I'm going to tell you, God's going to be with you every single step of the way. Every single step of the way. We live in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the greatest city on the planet, in my opinion. And there's a lot of amazing hikes that you can go on all over the place. Right? I, like, I love, even in the middle of the city, you can go on a hike. What in the world? I love Phoenix. It's fantastic. One of my favorite hikes is one that is close to us. It's called, it's called the Flatiron. Anybody in here been on the Flatiron? I love that hike. It is brutal. Just letting you know. It is a brutal hike. If you, if you want to go through pain on a Saturday, then just call up Eric. He'd love to be able to go with you. Just letting you know. <laughs> Don't call me. Call Eric. He'd love to be able to. It's a hard climb. You're doing a lot of scrambling up this climb, and, but it is fun. It is amazing. And the very first time that Eric actually took me on that climb, I was thinking to myself a couple of times, I don't think I'm going to make it. My legs are on fire right now. Like, I really think they're on fire. There's an internal fire that is taking place. I'm not sure if, like, physically, I can go up the next step. 
And it would have been so easy for me to be able to say, no, nah, I'm done, man. I don't have anything to prove to anybody. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just sit right here. But instead, what you can do is you can just take the next step. There's doubts and fears that every single one of us face, some of us on a, on a daily basis. And if you continue to speak all of those doubts and fears over your life, then you are not going to accomplish what God has for you. But instead, if you just be able to say, you know what? I don't know what the future holds and I don't know where this mountain is gonna be able to take me, but every day I'm gonna take the next step through the faith in Jesus Christ. And he is gonna be able to strengthen me, he's gonna be able to guide me, and I'm gonna tell you that if you continue taking steps, the next thing you know that there are mountains that you are overcoming on a daily basis that you can absolutely speak into your future, that you're not gonna be held back by situations. Instead, you're gonna be able to say, man, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the spirit that resides inside of me, and he has created me to be an overcomer. And you can absolutely speak into your future by the words that you say. Choose to be life-giving to your future. You gotta choose to be life-giving to other people. Choose to be life-giving into your future. And the last one, Frankie, the last one. <laughs> I choose to be life-giving to myself. I choose to be life-giving to myself. The words you say have a major impact on your children. The words you say have a major impact on your spouse, on your boyfriend or your girlfriend. The words you say have a major impact into your friends and your coworkers. But the person that impacts, that your words impact the most is you. Because nobody's around you more than you. <laughs> Nobody speaks into your life more than you. Some of us, we do that vocally in the middle of the night. I'm walking, trying to go to the bathroom, and then I stub my toe. <laughs> Who moved that chair this time around? No. Oh, it was me. I don't care. I'm still angry. Everybody. <laughs> and sometimes that grumbling doesn't just happen in the middle of the night when a pain comes. Sometimes the grumbling happens in the morning. I don't want to go face this day. I'm not ready and prepared for this presentation that I've got to be able to give and everybody's going to look at me and I'm sick and tired of all of these coworkers and I'm grumbling and grumbling and I, this traffic is horrible and this is, and everything is just horrible. It's blah. I don't want to be able to go to school today, man. I've got this test that's coming up and I'm just sick and tired of this thing and, and everybody's making fun of me and I hate going to lunch and, and you're just speaking negativity over yourself over and over and over again and then you wonder why you're caught in the middle of this trap. You have to choose the words that you say to yourself carefully. Are you going to let failure define you? Or are you going to let God define you? You need to choose the words that you say. You have a mountainous situation in front of you. I, we all have them at times. Years ago at a different church that Jenny and I were pastoring at, Somebody there, his name was Dave. Dave was, Dave was diagnosed with cancer. And Dave had to go to a treatment facility for six months. He was living there. And Dave, when, when the diagnosis came, and, and uh, the great thing for him to be able to even go to that, to that cancer treatment area, uh, it was horrible news. Anybody, the C word, it's horrible. Oh, good. And I remember the first time I talked to Dave about it, I was just heartbroken for him. And all of a sudden, I came up and I was like, oh, Dave. And he was like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what's going on, man? Like, I, did, I heard you got bad news. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm going, I'm going up to this treatment center up in, in Chicago. Uh, man, we got, I got 
I got this cancer that's going on and uh, it's not good. But hey, watch out. Watch out. What do you mean watch out? Hey, that treatment center better watch out. That chemo better watch out. Because I'm already planning that every time I got to sit down with that IV inside of my arm, I'm waiting for that person that's going to be sitting down next to me. I'm going to be such a blessing to that person, they better watch out. Whoa. I can't wait to be able to meet my nurses. Because my nurses, they might not know Jesus, but they're going to know him by the time I'm done. I can't wait to be able to meet my doctors. Because I can't wait to be able to share with them how good that my God is during the middle of this horrible time in my life. And how you speak to yourself is so important. Are you going to choose to be life-giving to yourself? Or is everything just horrible? Today, I declare war. I declare war on the words that are coming into my life from me and from other people as well. I'm going to tell you today, oh, the older that I get, the more selective on who I allow to speak into my life. I'm not just letting anybody speak into my life. Hey, you're tearing me down. I'm not doing that. I'm not, you're not speaking to my life anymore. Well, they're friends of mine. I've been friends with them forever. Let me tell you something. Friends don't hold you down. Anchors hold you down. Friends build you up. Friends spur you on. You want to know the quickest and the most effective way for you to change your life? Change your friends. I'm not allowing people to speak into my life that are tearing me down. Even if it's me. Today we got to make the choice. The choice to either be life-giving or life-taking. Life-giving the way we speak to other people. Life-giving in the way that we speak to our future. Life-giving in the way that we speak to ourselves. I don't know about you, but as for me and my house, we choose to be life-giving. Today, we choose to be life-giving. Today, we're going to build each other up and not tear each other down. Today, we're going to spur each other on. We're going to encourage each other. We choose to be life-giving. Church, would you please stand with me today? And let me tell you today, let me tell you this right away. The most important words that you can say on choosing to be life-giving is the choice to follow Jesus. Romans says that if we confess with our mouth and declare that he is Lord, if we believe it in our heart and we, we say it out loud, then we're saved. You're choosing life, eternity over death, and that's not the life that God has for you. That you just say yes to following Jesus. Today I choose to say yes. Today I choose to be life-giving. Today I choose to spur somebody else on. And the most powerful thing that you can do is say yes to Jesus. And so church, here's what I want to ask you to do today is that I'm going to ask you to be able to shout out yes to Jesus, that we're going to do a little howling together by just shouting out how much we love our Lord. And so today at the count of three, I want everybody who believes it in their heart to be able to shout out yes to Jesus. Maybe it's the first time for you, or maybe it's just the first time today, but we're going to do this together. Yeah. One, two, Three, yes! This is our war cry, we'll rise up. And this is...